There is only one word I can say to describe the main event of this week. Revolution. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, the British and Indian forces pushed up the Tigris towards Baghdad, the Ottomans pulling back both there and in Persia, where they were being chased by the Russians. Russia had big problems at home, with food riots, strikes, and demonstrations all week in Petrograd. The Toplitsa rebellion continued in the Balkans, and Woodrow Wilson was inaugurated for his second term as United States President. Here's what came next. As I said at the beginning, revolution came this week, and it came to Russia. Russia had been in a state of chaos for a while now, with hundreds of strikes over the past few months, as well as food riots and demonstrations like last week. This was all centered in Petrograd, the capital, and, especially since Rasputin was killed a few months ago, it was centered against Tsar Nicholas. By this time, large numbers of the military had even gone over to the revolutionaries. Things came to a head this week as the February Revolution broke out. It's called that because this is February under the old calendar in use in Russia at the time. On Saturday, March 10th, by our calendar, huge crowds were in the streets as they had been for days. The Cossacks were ordered to fire on them and they turned their guns on the police instead. This ended generations of Cossack loyalty to the government. The Tsar was asked to return to Petrograd from army headquarters and do something. He wrote back, I order that the disorders in the capital be ended tomorrow. Yep, that'll do it. The next day was, though, a lot quieter in the streets, and Nicholas sent an order for the dismissal of the Duma, the parliament. They voted to disregard it, thus joining the revolutionaries. On the 12th, the 17,000 soldiers of the Petrograd garrison joined the huge crowds demonstrating against the Tsar. Soldiers loyal to him and the police tried to keep order, but there was fighting in the streets, and they were hugely outnumbered. The law courts and police stations were set on fire. The armory was attacked and looted, and the Russian Revolution had begun. Nicholas began the long journey to Petrograd, but as he neared the capital, reports of violence along the line made getting there impossible. The revolutionaries held the main stations near town, and Nicholas was stopped at the small town of Pskov. The next day, the captain of the cruiser Aurora in Petrograd for repairs was killed by revolutionary sailors, and other mutinying sailors near the capital killed or arrested over a hundred officers. The Russian admiralty surrendered. Former Prime Minister Sturmer became prisoner in the Duma. Current Prime Minister Boris Golitsyn and War Minister General Belyaev were removed from office. The Duma formed a provisional government on the 15th, and though Moscow, Kharkov, and Odessa declared themselves for the provisional government, the Petrograd Soviet was a rival authority. This was a council of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies that challenged the Duma's leadership, and they would soon begin a dual power situation competing for legitimacy. The Petrograd Soviet ordered that all weapons are to be controlled by elected committees. The Russian Army Chief of Staff Mikhail Alexeyev, on the morning of the 15th, urged the Tsar to abdicate. He actually urged the other army commanders to join him in this appeal. General Ruski believed that the only thing that could prevent total anarchy was abdication. General Brusilov thought only abdication could preserve the monarchy and Russia's ability to continue the war. Grand Duke Nikolai in the Caucasus and General Sakharov on the Romanian front urged abdication. And by the early afternoon, all of their replies by telegram were given to the Tsar. The army would not keep Nicholas in power. A few moments later, Tsar Nicholas Romanov telegraphed Alexeyev, In the name of the welfare, tranquility, and salvation of my warmly beloved Russia, I am ready to abdicate from the throne. The crown was passed to his brother, the Grand Duke Michael, who rejected the throne, afraid of the revolutionaries, and the 300-year-old rule of the Romanovs was over, and all the secret treaties and agreements made with the Allies were no longer valid. Nicholas seemed fairly calm about the whole thing, and only really seemed concerned about his family, who were basically prisoners since the 40,000-strong garrison at Tsarskoye Selo joined the revolution. Also. All five of his kids had the measles, which was a big deal in 1917. As for the Tsarina, here's what A World Undone has to say about her. 
After years of almost insanely self-destructive behavior, she began to display the strength and calm acceptance that would support her family through the months of life that remained to them. Grand Duke Nikolai and Alexeyev supported the new provisional ministry, which included George Lvov as Prime Minister, Pavel Milukov as Foreign Minister, and Alexander Kerensky as Minister of Justice. Their government proclaimed the following principles freedoms of the press, association, speech, and labor organization, the freedom to strike, and the extension of these freedoms to the troops as far as conditions allow, abolition of all social, religious, and national restrictions. Preparations began for an assembly, but let's make clear that this had not been an organized revolution, but something that blossomed from a series of simultaneous uprisings against a corrupt regime. And you did now have two rival organizations with ambitions of control. And the Petrograd Soviet had issued its own order, Order Number no. 1, which was a manifesto for the military that allowed political representation, expanded individual freedom, and a certain degree of Soviet or council control. This, as you may guess, is kind of the opposite of military discipline. At first, it was only to be in the Petrograd area, but it soon spread so there were Soviet committees all over the army, including at the front. On the 16th, there was a mutiny in the Russian Baltic fleet, and in Zurich, as the week came to an end, Vladimir Lenin, in exile, heard the news of the revolution. But Petrograd was not the only city getting a new government this week. On March 11th, British and Indian troops occupied Baghdad. Some 15,000 soldiers were captured in the following confusion. Ottoman general Khalil Pasha, Enver Pasha's uncle, withdrew to Mosul with 30,000 men. Gertrude Bell, the British Middle East expert, well, she was much more than that, and has even been called the female Lawrence of Arabia, and she'll have her own special. She said, that's the end of the German dream of domination in the Near East. Their place is not going to be in the sun. The British were worried that the Ottomans would flood the Tigris River, but that never happened. And taking Baghdad was a big morale boost after last year's humiliation at Kut, and the Ottomans were now basically forced to end actions in Persia and build up their army in case the British marched on Mosul. And a whole Ottoman province had now come under British rule, which was good news for the British, although it did spark infighting between the British governments in London and India about who was in charge now. The thing is, the capture of Baghdad wasn't really an end in itself, and Peter Hart in The Great War writes, Mesopotamia was like a vast sponge sucking in British military resources. What had really been gained once the oil fields had been secured in 1914? Nothing. The whole Mesopotamian campaign had been an object lesson in mission creep. But if things weren't going so well for the central powers in the Middle East, they were going okay in the Balkans. On March 12th began the Austro-Hungarian and Bulgarian counterattack against the Toplica rebellion. The Serbian forces numbered eight or nine thousand rebels and had taken a bunch of small towns and began setting their sights on even larger towns that could conceivably make a path to Salonika. The Central Powers attacks were under the command of Alexander Protogerov and Tane Nikolov and had about 30,000 troops joining the fight. After just a few days of fighting, the Bulgarians had retaken Prokupie and the Austrians Kershumilia. And by the end of the week, though the fighting had been heavy, it looked like the rebels were going to be defeated. And further to the south, the Allies began their spring campaign in Macedonia. And here are a couple of notes to end the week. On the 13th, China breaks off diplomatic relations with Germany. A couple weeks ago, a German sub had drowned 543 Chinese laborers heading for the Western Front and 700,000 men from Belgium were now working on German farms and in factories. And that was the week. Serbian rebels beginning to falter, Baghdad falling to the British, and a revolution in Russia. And that would mean what for the war? The Tsar had wanted to continue the fight. But did the two new Russian governments want that? And what would that mean for the other allies? They were pretty quick to claim to support the provisional government, but part of that was to help try to persuade the U.S. to join the war, since you can't really say you're fighting for freedom when your huge ally has an absolute monarch. And what would this mean for the Eastern Front, for Romania, for the Caucasus, for the world? At the moment, it's anybody's guess. 
If you want to find out more about the situation in Russia before the February Revolution, you can check out our special episode about it right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Sebastian Lissouf. Thanks to Sebastian and the other Patreon supporters, we were able to make this show even better. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.